Good morning. It is 10 o'clock in the morning, Philippines time. Welcome to everyone who is in the Philippines with us today. Welcome to those who are not yet in our building and welcome to those who are joining us on the World Wide Web. We wish to say thank you to each and every one of you for joining us here this morning at the Silang Church of Christ. We are glad that you are here and our song leader just got here, so I will let him open the song. Good morning. Uh, let's start by singing hymn number 682. 682. God be the glory. 682. To God be the glory. Are we to put that in? To God be the glory. Great things he has done. So love he will that he gave us his son. Pagkatapos po ng weekend to, lahat po tayo tatayo at tayo mananalangin. 708, Walking in Sunlight. Awitin po natin. Let's sing. Walking in sunlight, all of our journey, over the mountain, to the deep veil. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises. Jesus is 
is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and God. He is the light, in Him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to His side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. Turn. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing His praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. Let us all stand for our opening prayer. Let's bow down and let us pray. Almighty Father, our God in heaven, once again we come before you in your holy presence, thanking you, O Lord, for the opportunity and the time. Thanking you, O Lord, for the blessings and the strength that you've given to us that now we may serve you. Dear Lord, may you be with us as we continue to sing praises and hymns to you. May you be with us, O Lord, as we once study your holy word. May this enlighten us. May this guide us and help us also, O Lord, that we may share all of your blessings to people around us. May you guide us, O Lord, during this time of pandemic. May you keep us safe and also our, the brethren that are worshiping you all around the world. May you bless them, keep them safe from harm. May you also bless and be with our brethren that have sickness, brethren that have problems, O Lord. We call your name and we ask you that you may be with them during this time that they need you, O Lord. Once again, O Lord, we ask you that you give us strength and give us courage that we may do the things that you ordered us to do, that we may share the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, to people around us and to people, our loved ones that haven't accepted him as their Lord and Savior. May you also, O Lord, forgive us for the sins that we have committed to you Forgive us for the sins that we have done to people around us. May you clean us every day, O oh Lord. This we pray in the name of our Savior and our God, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Isa po sa bahagi ng ating pananambahan ay ang banal na dulang na dito natin iniisip at inaalala kamatayan natin Panginoon at Diyos ni Jesus. Awitin natin number 12 bago po tayo dumako sa mga panalangin. Number 12, Alas and did my Savior be. Let us sing the first, the third, and the fifth stanza. First, third, and fifth only. Alas and did my Savior live. Let us sing. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote the sacred head or son the cross at the 
cross where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away, rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Third, well, my the sun is the and shot his glory in when Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature sin at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away, rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am the of the day. Fit. But drops of grief can it repay the sa isipan, sa ating muling pag-alala, sa kamatay ng ating Panginoon na Diyos na si Jesus. Bago po tayo manalangin para sa tinapay at kadas na ubas, basahin ko po ang nakasulat sa 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. Bago ang ating panalangin. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread, and then He given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Tayo po yung nalangit para sa tinapay. Tayo mo ko tayo nalangit. Panginoon Diyos, nakila at makapangyarihan. Kami nagpapasalamat sa pagpapala niyo sa amin. At sa pagkakataon, Ama, na muli namin isipin at alahanin ang kamatay namin dakilang Panginoon at agapagligtas na si Jesus na ibinigyan ka niyong buhay para kami maligtas sa mga aming mga kasalanan. Panginoon, dakila na ngayon na sarap namin na tinapay ng walang libadura na sumisimbolo sa katawan na aming Panginoon. Dakila, Ama, basbasan ninyo ito at ang bawat isa natatanggap ng tinapay na ito. Ito, Ama, higit sinasamo namin at dadalangin sa ngala namin tagapagligtas at aming Panginoon na si Jesus. Amen.
Kaya naman naman nalangin para sa katas ng labas. Dakilang Diyos, may lumalapit sa inyo at nagpapasalamat sa kaligtasan na ibinigay mo sa amin sa pamagitan na pagkamatay ng yung dakilang anak na si Jesus. Dakilang Ama, ngayon ay sarap namin na katas ng ubas na kawangis ng kanyang dugo na bumuhos sa bundok ng Kalbaryo. Siyang dugo, Ama, na luminis sa amin sa aming mga kasalanan. Mas masin na nawa ninyo ito at ang bawat sa amin na tatanggap ito. Nawa may isipin namin mabuti bago namin inumin katas ng ubas na ito. Para may dadalangin namin, hinihiling namin sa inyo, sa ngala namin tagapagligtas na si Jesus. Amen. Mga kapatid, hiwalay po sa banal na dulang ang isa rin ang inutos sa araw ng mga kristyano ang, ang pag-ambagan, pagkakaloob. Tayo ay ating basahin ng nakasulat sa 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 7 bago ang ating panalangin. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 7, ito po nakasulat. Remember this, whoever so sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever so generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Tayo po ay manalangin para sa pagkakalo. Dakilang Diyos, ang manamin sa langit. Kami nagsapapasalamat ama sa iyong dakilang pag-ibig sa amin. At sa iyong pagpapala sa amin. Ibigay ng buhay na ito. Ibigay ng mga trabaho at ang mga ligosyo na aming pinag Dakila Ama, muli ang iyong mga lingkod ay magbibigay ng salapi ay sa tabi nila upang makatulong sa iyong banal na iglesia. Dakila Ama, hinihiling namin na patuloy mo kami patubayan, patuloy mo kami ingatan at palain sa aming mga nakukuha. Dakila Ama, nung ay patuloy kami lumapit sa inyo at tawa Ama, makatulong rin kami sa mga nangailangan. Dakila Ama, dadalang rin namin na ang salapi malilikom sa mga ito ay gamitin lamang sa ikaw lalago at katutupan ng Panay Iglesia. Gayun din naman sa mga kapatid namin na nangangailangan. Ito ang mahilin na lapit at sinasabong namin sa inyo sa ngala namin tagapagigtas at aming Panginoon na si Jesus. Amen.
Thank you, brother. Mga kapatid, tayo nandako sa pag-ihinig yung mensahe ng Panginoon sa panguna ng kapatid Ernest. Awitin po natin number 632 para sa paganda sa pag-ihinig ng mensahe. Number 632, the gospel is for all. Of one the Lord has made the race, true one has cut the fall. Where sin has gone, must go His grace, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone, must go His grace, the gospel is for all. Say not the hill and up and hope beyond we have no call. For why should we be blessed alone? The gospel is for We are so pleased that all of you are with us this morning. We are pleased if you are in our building. We are pleased if you are joining us online. And I ask that you help us as we continue to study and worship God's word. Um, last week, we began a sermon series, uh, The Great Escapes of the Bible. And last week, if you remember, we spoke about Paul's escape. Escape. Notice I forgot to put an S at the end of that, right? Because how many times did Paul escape? Many times, right? However, today we're going to talk about one escape, and it's probably one of the best-loved Bible stories. Escape from a great fish. Now, If you hear it told in Sunday school class, it's entirely possible that you hear about a whale. And the, those who are skeptics to the gospel are quick to point out that whales can't swallow large things. However, scripture does not tell us that it was escape from a whale. God's word says in Hebrew that it's a fish. Of course, I just forgot the Hebrew word that goes with that. Um, 
if we look at the story of Jonah, what we are going to see, by the way, those of you who are here in the audience, open your Bibles to the book of Jonah, put a bookmark there, because we're going to make some side trips, but we're going to be coming back. As we look at the story of Jonah, we are going to see a command. As we further examine the book of Jonah, we are going to see a contradiction. As we continue our examination, we will find a confrontation. And at the end of the book of Jonah, we will find a correction. Now, understand something. When you and I ignore the commands of God for your life, for my life, for our lives, we put ourselves in the same place that Jonah was. So let's start our reading in Jonah chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. The word of Jonah, word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Because of its wickedness has come up before me. There's a parallel here between the city of Nineveh and the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. In the book of Jonah, the complaints against Nineveh have come up to the Lord. And if we look at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah from the book of Genesis, we find out that the stories had come up to the Lord and he must go down to investigate. So if we assume that God operates on a plane higher than ours, we are in safe territory. Verse three, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for the port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. God said, I want you, Jonah, to leave Joppa and go 550 miles to the northeast, and I want you while you are there to go preach to Nineveh. Jonah had other ideas. He decided he would go 2,500 miles directly to the west. Not even close to being in the right direction and much further away. Now, we all know something about the story of Jonah. Like I said earlier, skeptics have doubted that the story is true. However, if we read Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, Matthew 12 and 40, go there, please. Kish, can you help me? Matthew 12 and 40, Jesus Christ is going to quote this story. When the pages quit, everybody's on the right page. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In the story of Jonah, we see very clearly a command. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, God says, Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. What is the command? Arise, get up, go to Nineveh and preach against it. So who was this guy called Jonah? 
Well, he was the son of Amittai, and he was a prophet, a, a prophet of Israel, according to the book of 2 Kings chapter 14. Go there. 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25 and following. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Labo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord. The God of Israel spoken through his prophet Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hepner. Verse 26. The Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel from under the heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Jehosh. Jonah prophesied approximately 780 years, approximately eight centuries prior to the time of Christ. So we know who Jonah was. Who was Nineveh? Nineveh was the capital city of a kingdom called Assyria, and it's located on the Tigris River in a country today known as Iraq. If you look at videos, photos, soldiers who were serving in Iraq frequently took pictures of the ruins of Nineveh. At the time of Jonah's ministry, they were domineering. They were an enemy of Israel on the political stage. Now, about 710 BC, which would make it 70 years after Jonah, they eventually conquered Israel. Now, Nineveh was famous in the ancient world because it was the center of worship for Astarte. And those of you who have read your Old Testament much, don't have to go very far to find stories about Asherah poles and gods of Baal, right? We've all heard of those, I'm sure, because I've spoken about them. Today, I will not give you the details on what, I won't give you all of the details on what service to Asherah involved. Ladies, Look around you. Those of you who have daughters and nieces, think about what I'm getting ready to say. As service to Asherah, you are required to spend 90 days serving as what is known as a temple prostitute, which means the next guy coming through the door who wants to worship Asherah, guess how he does this? Okay, enough details for now. I think we can figure it out, right? God did not like this. So the size of Nineveh was, Nineveh was a cultural center for worship to Asherah. It was also a fairly large city. And since you have your bookmarks in the book of Jonah, you can look at Jonah 3.3 3 and Jonah 4.11. You are going to find that it is a city of approximately 120,000 men. Not including women, children, and animals, and God mentions all of them. It was a three-day journey, according to... Jonah chapter 4, verse 11, across the city, walking. 
the classical writers, those non-biblical writers from Greek history, tell us that it was over 60 miles wide. I've been for a walk and walking 20 miles in one day will probably make you tired. And if you get up and do it again tomorrow, you're really going to be tired. It was more than 60 miles. Nineveh is described in Genesis chapter 10, verse 11, as having been founded by Nimrod, the hunter. By the way, Nimrod, the hunter, did something else in scripture. Does anybody know what it is? The building of the Tower of Babel. Okay, see all these things, there's only one story all the way through. And that story is the salvation of man through Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. So if we can find places where they connect, it makes sense. We've all heard the story of the Tower of Babel, right? And we've all heard the story of Jonah, right? Did we know they were connected? The same guy that built the Tower of Babel also started the city of Nineveh. Now, outside of the Bible, using extra biblical historical sources, Nineveh was known as being a great, lawless, and ruined city. If you read your Greek history, you will find Nineveh mentioned by little no name people like Herodotus, or maybe this guy, Aristotle, you might have heard of him. They both mention Nineveh in their writings. They catalog the sinfulness that occurred. They describe Serendopolis, its legendary last king, in unflattering, unflattering means not nice, and problematic terms. Theodorus of Sicily describes Serendopolis violations of the gender roles of Greek and Roman antiquity. According to legend, his behavior became so bad that his population rebelled against his behavior. Whereupon the king had an answer. He piled all of his gold and jewels and silver in a great big pile, climbed on top of it with all of his eunuchs and his concubines, and set it afire, burning the entire palace to the ground. So are we talking about a nice guy? No, right? God wants Jonah to go to Assyria and tell them to repent. Why did he do that? He did that because God does not want anybody to be destroyed. He doesn't want you or me or the biggest sinner in the world to end up in hell. Go to Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 32. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 32. For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Now he gives us some instructions. Repent and live. You've got your bookmark still in Jonah, right? Go to Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. And I, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people, who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. So 
aren't you glad that God hasn't told you to go preach to Nineveh? Aren't you glad that God has no such command for you? Oh, but wait a minute. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, verse 18 and following. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Pay attention, folks. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Wait a minute, aren't you glad that God hasn't told you to go to Nineveh. He hasn't, but he has told you, we've discussed this before, as you are going, going where? Going to the laundry, going to the grocery store, going to the market, going to your house, going to your neighborhood. As you are going, wherever you are going, you and I are to carry the gospel with us. How you doing? Are you doing better than Jonah did? Because the next point I'm going to bring out is there's a contradiction. We have a command from God to Jonah, right? We also have a command from God to us. Jonah chose not to obey the command of God. Instead of going 500 miles northeast, he went 2,500 miles due west. I've always heard it said it went the opposite direction, not exactly. If you're looking at a clock, northeast is kind of two o'clock on your clock. And west is number nine. However, he didn't go the right way and he wasn't planning on arriving there. So he fled to Tarshish instead. He fled from the presence of the Lord. That's a mistake some of us make too. Maybe God isn't seeing what I'm doing right now. Because after all, the presence of the Lord isn't in this place. He's restricted to that church building down the road. And as long as I'm not in there, I'm okay. Hmm. He found a ship at Joppa. And pay attention. He paid the fare. So where is Tarshish? Tarshish is in Northern Africa or Southern Spain. Nowhere near Iraq, he wasn't interested in going to Nineveh. It was literally the wrong way. He was going from the, away from the presence of God. So where did the Jonah think the presence of God was? Maybe he thought it was the land of Israel. Maybe he thought it was the city of Jerusalem. So I have a question for you. Can you, can I, can we flee from the presence of God? I don't know, let's find an answer, Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verse 7. When the pages quit, everybody's there. Psalm 
Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise up on wings at dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. So Jonah wanted to flee from the presence of God. There's only one problem. Where is God? He's aware of everywhere, right? He is in heaven. We do know that. He found a ship at Joppa and he paid his fare. Got a plan. He wanted the protection of not being a stowaway because a stowaway, they're just going to put you off at the next port. He wanted to pay the fare the whole way because he didn't want to go where God told him to. He went to great lengths to get away from the commands of God. So how about you? How about me? How about the people around us? What do they do when they want to get away from God? Some people get involved in drugs. There's illegal drugs, ones that are against the law. And there are legal drugs you can get from your doctor that will alleviate your mental consciousness. Some, they want to escape and they use entertainment. They go to the movies, they watch TV, they play video games all the time. They're not worried about God. Some want a legitimate excuse. So they work all the time. Is it wrong to work? No, it is not. But God must always come first. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. tells us nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of whom, to whom we must give account. That means no matter what you do, you want to go to the movies, you want to work, whatever, get involved in drugs, whatever it is you're going to do, one day, you're going to give an accounting to God for what you did with the time, the treasure, and the talent that he entrusted to you while you were on this earth. Now we're going to have a confrontation. The Lord confronts Jonah's disobedience. He sent out a great wind, a great storm that threatened the safety of the ship. The men of the ship ended up throwing the cargo into the ocean so that the ship wouldn't sink. They wanted to make the boat lighter. Jonah, meantime, was asleep in the hold of the ship. The captain of the ship, he confronts Jonah's disobedience. The captain found him sleeping in the hold of the ship and said, what are you doing? Don't you know the ship is sinking and you're down here sleeping? So the captain woke him up and told him to call on his God so that they might be saved. 
Then the crew cast lots to determine who was responsible for all this trouble. Guess whose lot came up? Yep, that guy, Jonah. So Jonah tells him his story. Go back to jo Jonah chapter one. Keep your bookmark there, remember? Jonah chapter one, verse eight. Jonah chapter one, verse eight and following. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where are you from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew. And I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land, verse 10. This terrified them. And they ask, what have you done? They knew he, they already knew he was running away from the Lord because he told them so. And the crew was afraid because of what Jonah had done. And they ask a question, what do we do now? Well, the cap God confronted Jonah's disobedience. The captain confronted Jonah. The crew confronted Jonah. And now Jonah has to confront his own disobedience. And he tells them, to throw him into the sea. The men, they didn't want to do it, but they finally did. They prayed that God would not charge them with innocent blood. Come on, let's be real. It's a storm and I'm gonna throw you overboard. I'm afraid I might have to answer to God for doing something wrong. And these people apparently, pagans though they were, showed a more willingness to obey God than Jonah did. They offered a sacrifice to God and they took vows. So what about us? What about you? What about me? Are we confronting the issues that separate us from God? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13 and verse five. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. That's 2 Corinthians. Another Pauline letter, letter written by Paul, is the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6. Go there, please. Other way. Go to the right. Corinthians First Corinthians, second Corinthians, Galatians. Galatians chapter six, verse one. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the spirit should restore that person gently but watch yourselves or you too may be tempted. What are we supposed to do when somebody that we know, that we love, that is a member of God's church falls into sin? Gossip, right? No, we're supposed to gently restore them. But watch yourselves because you too might be tempted. Now there's a correction. God is going to correct 
Jonah's disobedience. God prepared a great fish for this. By the way, later on this week, if you are bored, Google fish swallows man. Believe it or not, it's happened at least six times in the last century. So don't tell me it can't happen. God prepared the fish and the fish swallowed Jonah and he was in the belly for three days and three nights. By the way, I don't ever want to be in that kind of darkness. <laughs> Jonah, he asked God for help with his affliction. Jonah, the prophet of God, waited until he was almost dead before he checked his ego and submitted to God's will. Even in those kind of circumstances, God did hear his prayer. Jonah learns that he is his own worst enemy. Go to Jonah chapter 2. You're in Jonah chapter 1. Go to Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. I'm going to take just a second and say this. If you see somebody bowing down and praying to a statue, they might think that they're getting closer to God. However, Jonah chapter 2 verse 8 tells us they are bowing before worthless idols and they are turning away from God's love for them. Verse 9. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Does it sound like Jonah got humbled a little bit? Yes, it does. God saved Jonah from the great fish. God spoke to that fish and it vomited Jonah up on dry land. So what about you? What about me? How well do we accept the correction that God gives us? Go to Revelations chapter 3, verse 19. Revelations chapter 3, verse 19. To those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Be earnest and repent. So let's tell the truth. If Jonah would have simply done what God told him or obeyed, how many Sunday school teachers would not be able to tell the story about Jonah and the great fish? How many times would Jonah have had to escape from a great fish? And the answer is zero, none, because he wouldn't have been there. How many times in your life and in my life have we found ourselves in a bad situation because we did not obey God. How many times, I'm not asking the question and I don't want anybody to volunteer the answer. You know the answer because I doubt for any of us, the answer is zero. 
Some of us are a little more hard-headed than some of the other ones. Put me in the hard-headed camp. Um, so we didn't learn too good the first few times. But we start doing what God tells us to in life, and we're going to have more joy than we knew. Let us remember, God gives commands to you and to me, and they're contained in his word. We can obey, or we can choose to contradict those commands. God gives us free choice. If we do disobey and contradict the commands of God, there will be a confrontation between you and, or me, or us, and God. Guess who's got the power? It's not us. And after there's a confrontation, there'll be a correction. And you can choose at that time to start doing the things that God wants you to do in your life, or you can choose to confront him some more. If you are a member of this church or not, and you're a Christian, but you've fallen back in love with the ways of the world, you've decided to confront God a few more times, and you've discovered it's not going like you think that it should, if you're in need of public repentance, come have a seat and we'll take care of that. If you're a member of this church or just a Christian who happens to be here this morning and you are in need of prayers for healing, for jobs, for emotional distress, whatever that is, you come have a seat and we will be glad to have a prayer with you. And we will pray that God will bring you the peace that comes from doing his will. And if you have never put on Jesus Christ through the act of baptism for the remission of your sins, come have a seat while together the rest of us stand and sing the invitation song. Let us sing number 50, 5-0. Are you washed in the blood? Let us sing the first, the second, and the fourth stanza. First, second. Let us sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing for? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his graces? Or are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In the 
soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Good morning. We thank God for this opportunity we have to gather together and worship him. And I'm going to ask at this time that you join me in prayer. God, we come before you this morning thanking you for the blessings that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we receive through trials. Thank you, Lord, for this COVID virus, because it's been a hard trial on many people. But it helps us to find those that are truly seeking you on a daily basis in their life. We thank you, Lord, for this virus, because it helps us discover the things that are important. It's not important what your car or your clothing looks like. It's important what your heart looks like to you, God. God, we thank you for many things that we have. We thank you for the opportunity to share fellowship. We thank you for the freedom to gather together and worship you. And God, we ask that you help us as we fulfill your commands. May we truly be the salt and light to the world that's around us. Through Christ's name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm. 